Let's, um, let's get rolling in the uh, section that we're starting tonight. Mm. There we go. If this doesn't get me even just in just a little bit of trouble, I don't know what will. I mean, come on, people. From Karl Marx to the summer of 2020, what got us here? Um, remember what we're doing in this series on Tuesday nights is a little bit of a worldview overview to understand the ideas and the ideologies that are shaping the culture around us that are creating a new, uh, a new vocabulary for us, a new structure to society. What's going on? What are the ideas behind it? So that's what we're going to spend time doing. We're going to make sure we're rooted in Scripture and how Scripture talks about um, our endurance in the faith and what truth versus falsehood is. Um, and then we're going to try to make sense of some of these worldviews as time goes on. So this is the little section that we're getting started tonight. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for this evening, for this time together. We ask, Lord, for your grace and wisdom, your direction tonight. Help us, Lord, to think clearly, to honor you in all that we say and do tonight. And help us, Father, to see with your eyes... God, that this is not a matter of hatred of neighbor, but of love of neighbor, the kind of love that you have called us to, to love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as Scripture tells us, sometimes it requires us to make sense of what's going on around us. So help us to be able to do that tonight and over the next few Tuesday nights in this series. We're thankful for this time. We ask your blessing upon everything that happens in this building tonight that, God, it would be a blessing to your people and that we would find ways to glorify you and lift you up today. In your wonderful and magnificent name we pray, Lord. Amen. Um, all right, so just as you guys are interested, I'm going to continue to sort of bring some books in and shuffle them through if you want to take a look at some of these things, see if you're interested in any of them. Uh, so that's the book table over there right now if you want to take a look at those after we're done. None of those are free. Um, all of those will cost you your life if you take them from me. So you feel free to take a look at those later on. So those are, that's some good stuff. All right. <clears throat> I want to spend a, a couple of minutes as we get started in Scripture to understand again why I think this kind of work is important for us. I told us last week we're actually going to do some work. Um, we're going to hear some names we've never heard before. We're going to process through some ideas we've never processed before. But the point is to make sense of all of it, to draw it all together, and to help us to understand, again, what's going on around us. So we have this passage of Scripture from Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. The Apostle Paul says this, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible sounding arguments. We've talked about this before. Um, those who teach falsehoods or those who are even false teachers inside of the church, they don't wear the hat that says false teacher or the T-shirt that says false teacher warning. They don't say that. It's a plausible argument. It sounds like it could be right. It has a lot of promises attached to it. So a lot of people think, what could be wrong with this ideology? So the Apostle Paul, even though he's not with them to help them process this, he says, though I'm absent with you, I'm with you in spirit, I'm in this with you. Stick close to what you were taught, how you were taught. Stay rooted and firm in your faith in Jesus Christ, even in thanksgiving for everything that you have in Christ, because there are these philosophies out there. And it's empty deceit. It's according to the tradition of the world. And they are not philosophies that are according to the tradition of Christ. 
So the Apostle Paul is not saying everything that calls itself a philosophy, flush it down the toilet because all of that's bad. But everything that is an ideology or a philosophy that is according to the ways of this world, the thing of this world that's separated from Christ, he said, you've got to be really careful with those. And we've got to make sure we don't get fooled by those. But we have to think and process and love wisdom that is according to Christ. That's just what the word philosophy means. Phileo is love. So it's the love of wisdom. That's all that word means. So there's nothing evil in that at all. We just have to do it according to Christ. So the Apostle Paul considered this really important. He says this kind of thing um, several different ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He says, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So he said, there's actually this proactive work that we do. If there's an ideology that's raised itself against Christ and is causing harm amongst the body of believers or causing harm amongst the culture around us, we actually begin to work against that. So we're taking every thought captive, every idea, every ideology, um, everything about the way that we prioritize and work through life. We're taking these things captive for Christ so that we can, and I love that thought, so that we can actually obey Christ. And then um, we're going to keep throwing these in through our study as time moves on. I told you last, last week... Um, we're going to make sure we pay attention to passages in Scripture that deal with false teaching, what false teaching is and how it works. Um, this is one of those from Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14. This contains an incredibly important nugget to understanding, not just what we're starting to talk about tonight, but just false teaching in general. The prophet Jeremiah, who's weeping over the fall of the city of Jerusalem, who wrestled with false prophets for a very long time. He says this, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. They've given you false and deceptive oracles. They've given you false and misleading oracles. But what he throws in the middle of that little three-line stanza is he said they didn't tell you what your sin was. They, They manipulated what sin was because if they told you what your sin truly was and how it truly worked, then your fortunes with God would have been restored. This is one of the ways in which false teaching does its work is it assuages our own sense of guilt and sin. I'm not guilty, and this is... This is how it works 99% of the time. I'm not guilty of sin. Everybody else is guilty of sin. My neighbor is guilty of sin. You're guilty of sin. I'm not guilty of sin. So the misappropriation of how sin works is a big deal inside of false teaching. And uh, as time moves on, I think we'll see that and we'll get a chance to explicitly deal with that. Okay. Why didn't that work? Shoot. (laughs) It's going to reveal this piece by piece, but we're going to reveal it all at once for you now. Upper left-hand corner there, um, Karl Marx. Okay, so we're going to talk about Marxism. Tonight, we're going to try to understand Marx himself in his ideology. But what we're doing here is we're mapping out where we're headed and how we are headed in that direction. So we are still dealing with Karl Marx and his ideology, but it's changed in some radical ways. Some fundamental bits and pieces of it are still with us. In fact, some of the language we're going to use will sound very familiar to you, maybe even frustrating to you. But we need to understand the fountainhead and how we get to where we are now. So Karl Marx, and then Peeking out from behind Karl Marx is a guy, a philosopher, by the name of Georg Hegel. That's that crazy-looking guy in the upper left-hand corner behind Karl Marx. That's Hegel. And I love that little image of Hegel because it actually looks like he's peeking out from behind something. It's it's a famous painting and a sketch of this philosopher, Hegel. But uh, Marx is is dealing with Hegelian ideas, and so we're going to have to deal with him at least a little bit to understand where we're headed. 
Now, Marx, most of us understand, even if we have sort of a, a brief grasp of 20th century history, Marx and Marxism leads directly to, and we sort of immediately think of the Russian Revolution, and we think of uh, these beautiful people, uh, Lenin and Stalin. So these guys are direct descendants of Karl Marx and his vision of how communism works, on what Marxism is like. Now, both of those guys had their own versions of it. They did it slightly differently. And after them, there are other revolutions and there are other dictators and so forth who are a version of Marx or Lenin or Stalin or of other people, but all of it is in this family of Marxism and communism. But what Marx gets started, goes directly to Lenin and Stalin in Russia, is the bloodiest version of political philosophy in human history. Don't let anybody tell you differently. So there's this book out there that's hard to get a hold of unless you're willing to spend a lot of money now. It's called The Black Book of Communism. It was published by Harvard University Press. Now, the reason I tell you it was published by Harvard University Press is because there are some books that were published by Joe's Crab Shack. And if you buy a book published by Joe's Crab Shack, you should question the stuff that is inside of that book. But it's published by a serious, reputable, reviewed publisher, the Black Book of Communism is this huge book. It deals with communism in the 20th century. One of the most interesting things that it does is it counts the number of people who have died as a direct result of communism in the 20th century. And it really only spans a period of time of 50 to 60 years possibly. And that book counts between 95 and 100 million people dead. So this is what it takes to make Marxism work is a state has to kill its people. It's just, that's just what it ends up happening. Between 95 and 100 million people. Well, we'll talk about what this means, but Marx had a very particular vision for how communism was going to work, how it was going to come about, why it was going to happen. Very quickly in the early 20th century, they discovered that it, that wasn't happening. It happened in Russia, and other people tried in other nations and other locations. They expected it to be, begin to happen in places like Great Britain and Germany, and it just wasn't happening. So it frustrated a lot of his disciples. So what happens is we get this guy here underneath Karl Marx. He is the most influential Italian political prisoner in the 1920s you have never heard of. So of all of the Italian political prisoners in the 1920s that you have heard of, <laughs> this is the one you haven't. Antonio Gramsci is his name. You want to know his name. We'll talk about him. Of everything else on this, we'll talk about him maybe more in depth than a lot of other things. We're living in his world. We are today living in his world. We'll talk about what all of that means. But Antonio Gramsci got frustrated. He was, a, he was a devout communist. The Italians threw him in prison for 20 years because they didn't want their population exposed to his ideas. While he was in prison, he wrote 3,000 pages of notes that got smuggled out of prison, and everybody was exposed to his ideas anyway. And it turns into what we are living in today. So Gramsci was frustrated that these great big revolutions, it happened in Russia, but it wasn't happening anywhere else. Why wasn't it happening? How do we adjust the theory to make it happen where we believe it should happen, which is everywhere? And his answers to that question, why didn't it happen and how do we make it happen, is what we are literally living through right now. So when we get to him, it's going to be important to understand how he develops Marxism and what we today call cultural Marxism is a result of that dude right there, Antonio Gramsci. Well, not long after Antonio Gramsci, we get this group of um, German um, professors, uh, psychologists, philosophers, and so forth, um, who are at the school in Frankfurt, the university in Frankfurt, which is why they are just, there's about half a dozen of them, and they, we just call them the Frankfurt School because they all sort of uh, worked in the same sort of world. And they were also loyal communists. And when the Nazis took over in Germany, they fled Germany, 
And lucky us, they ended up in Columbia University here in the United States of America. And so their ideas and the way that they then continued to adjust Marx's thoughts become a part of American culture, English-speaking Western culture. So not just Italian or German um, or Great Britain because of where Karl Marx spent most of his life, but now inside of the American West as well. So their ideas begin to catch on. The Frankfurt School, there's about half a dozen of them or so. They're a bag of devils. Some of the most morally reprobate human beings you could spend time talking about, they also turn out to be some of the most influential thinkers in the American world in the 20th century. So we'll talk about them as well. But as a result of the Frankfurt School and the students that they had, and then the students of those students, so we have a direct line from the Frankfurt School teachers um, in the early to mid 20th century here in the U.S., to the students that they taught, um, those become the teachers of um, the teachers who create the disciples of the world that we now know of as the critical theory world. So the concept of critical theory was being built by the Frankfurt School. Then their disciples began to take that and, and push it into all of these different areas of society. So critical theory is this blanket term but inside of that, we've got all of these other versions of it. So there was originally critical legal theory, then critical race theory, and then there's critical gender theory and critical social justice theory. Um, and these, I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not just throwing the word critical in front of phrases. These are their terms and their books and their papers, and this, this is you know, kind of how they describe themselves. Postmodernism is inside of that whole bucket. So when schools and organizations and government organizations today go through diversity training um, that is informed by critical theory, um, all of that is a result of exactly this process. Um, so we are actually living in the world that this has created. So everything that came to the surface in the summer of 2020 even though for most folks, it was brand new vocabulary, it was brand new stuff, they were brand new questions, brand new um, confusions about culture, this stuff has been brewing for a very long time. Um, not just from Karl Marx, but then all of his disciples and disciples of disciples have been going on for a long time in some very deliberate sorts of fashions. What ends up happening with Cultural Marxism, um, white supremacy, uh, white privilege. There's a reason why there is a plus at the end of LGBTQIA+. One of those reasons is because of critical theory, and we'll get into all of that later on as well. It has become a certain kind of religion with all of the religious trappings built into it. And we'll develop that the further along this path that we get. But people have seen this as a religion for a long time. It's not just a handful of grumpy people right now saying that critical theory and cultural Marxism is a religion, is a substitute religion for Christianity. This has been going on for a long time now. So um, this dude, Frederick Copleston, is an absolute beast. So he was um, a Jesuit priest who in the 1960s, I believe it was, it might have been the late 1950s, um, he decided that we needed an updated history of all philosophy. So he's the guy who writes a 10 volume, I think it's a 10 volume history of philosophy, and he includes, includes in there a section on Karl Marx. And he notes this, and remember, this is 50, 60 years ago, maybe that he's writing this. But the point is that it is the Communist Party which has saved Marxism from undergoing the fate of other 19th century philosophies by turning it into a faith. We turn it into a religion. Now, a lot of these other 19th century philosophers, philosophers from the 1800s, you've never heard of or you think probably at some point at, in, a, in a course at school you might have heard the name Hegel. But none of us have read Hegel. Nobody wants to read Hegel. 
And one of the reasons is, is nobody took his ideology and forced it on the rest of the world as a brand new religion. But that's exactly what the Communist Party did, beginning in Russia, moving through the rest of Europe, and then finally the United States as well. And we'll get to, to some, I've given you some other readings. Some of you have been going through that reading, and I see the grimaces on your faces already. Um, but we'll talk about what some of that means as well. So we're not just dealing with an ideology that some people in the ivory tower believe. We're dealing with an ideology that as it has morphed through the ages has become probably the dominant religion in our culture. And I say that in all honesty. Probably the dominant cult religion in our culture right now. So how on earth does that all work out? Um, let's do a, a, a very, very brief bio. Um, could you click the next slide for me, Ming? A short biography of Karl Marx. And this is very brief. I'm just giving you what I think is interesting and important about Karl Marx. So just so you get a feel for it, 1818 to 1883, his father, uh, he's, a, he's a German Jew. So he was born in Germany. His father was a liberal Jew, so sort of a cultural Jew, who converted to Protestantism um, just before um, Marx was born. So Marx was born into a nominally cultural Christian family. He was actually baptized in, I believe, the Lutheran church in 1824. Um, and Marx later on in his life will actually reference how his soul was once given to God, but now has been given over to the devil. He actually says this kind of stuff in what he writes. So when he was older, he went to um, a university in Bonn, Germany, where he becomes a certain kind of disciple of this philosopher, Hegel. And so he begins this project of taking what he thinks was flawed in Hegel's philosophy and fixing it and changing it. He said, there's a nugget of truth here, but we're going to get rid of the stuff that's false, and here's how this philosophy actually works. And we're going to talk about um, that nugget um, here in just a minute or two so that we understand Hegel just a little bit. And if you understand Hegel just a little bit, you understand Hegel more than 99.999% of the rest of humanity. Karl Marx managed to get married, which is a stunning thing the more you learn about his actual life. He got married to a gal named Ginny. I give you her name because she's one of the most long-suffering human beings on the face of the planet. Um, he had two, I think, maybe three daughters with his wife, Jenny. When his in-laws discovered that he was a shiftless loser and was not going to make any money at all or take care of their daughter... They gave their daughter a nursemaid to take care of the home and to take care of the kids. Karl Marx ended up using her, keeping her in a side room, almost a closet um, in the apartment that they had and ended up having an illegitimate son with this gal. <clears throat> he was um, a profoundly racist and anti-Semitic individual. Um, so he, he was born a, a German Jew, but he was deeply anti-Semitic but it was more than that. Anybody who was not white European, um, his notes and letters and books are full of cruel things that he would say even to his friends. One of his daughters married a Cuban, a man from Cuba, and his affectionate pet name for him was the gorilla. So this is the kind of guy that Karl Marx was. Karl Marx never worked a day in his life. So a man who famously is for the cause of the worker against the evil capitalist robber baron individual, Karl Marx never worked a day in his life. As far as historians can tell, the only laborer he knew was the nursemaid who lived in their home. He hated laborers. He hated people who he believed were of a lower social status than he was. There's record of people who, as he was beginning to write, they were trying to get him into rooms with labor unions and so forth to talk to them because, I mean, this is his political philosophy, is helping these people who are not making enough money and need to revolt. He, and there's record of him walking to the room, berating everybody in the room, and then walking out. He had a way of making everybody in his life hate him. He lived off of money from his parents and his friends, which is profoundly ironic because he argues for an end to private property. 
Now, when you argue for an end to private property, one of the things that that means is that when you die, none of your property or your money goes to your kids. It goes to the state. No one's allowed to live off of an inheritance. No one's allowed to live off of land that they own and they work. But because he never worked a day in his life, he wrote his father constantly asking for money. Some of you know that one of his partners in crime was a guy by the name of Frederick Engels. He was constantly mooching off of Engels' rich, wealthy family. When Marx's father died, he refused to go to the funeral. Instead, he wrote his mom a letter saying, now that dad's died, I know there's a lot of money that's due to me. Could you please send that money to me? Right? So this is how Karl Marx thinks. It also turns out, I just love these facts. Karl Marx almost never bathed. He was a profoundly repellent human being just physically. And this gets noted in the biographies, the long biographies, the short biographies. He, okay, I'll, just, I'll just lay this out there for you. They say he was covered in boils everywhere. He was a profoundly uncomfortable, grumpy individual, horrible at personal hygiene. <laughs> and angry at the world. He was fascinated with the devil. The actual devil was fascinated with the devil. So Karl Marx didn't just write political works, the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, that kind of stuff. He was also a published playwright, like a lot of you know, aspiring writers in college are. They write a couple of plays. And in these plays, he is fascinated with the devil and how his soul has been given over to the devil. So some of you may know the name Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand wrote the book Tortured for Christ. He was a Lutheran pastor in the 1940s in Romania who was tortured by the communist officials there in Romania. So he wrote this book, Tortured for the Christ. He starts this organization about keeping track of the persecuted church and taking care of Christians around the world. He also wrote a book called Marx and Satan because Wormbrand wrote a biography about how he believed Karl Marx was not just fascinated with the devil, but was probably demon-possessed. Okay, so that's the book that Richard Wormbrand writes about Karl Marx. You're not going to hear that in your university course 101 on Marxism. So, Karl Marx refused to work, hated people. He was sickly and dysfunctional, but he was also a genius writer and propagandist. So as a result of that, in several other quirks of history, he ends up being one of the most influential public thinkers in the last 200 years. Most corners of the world are today affected one way or another by his philosophy and how his philosophy gets applied in different ways. So the guy just doesn't go away. So let's talk for a couple of minutes about some of his influences and a little bit about his politics and a little bit about his philosophy. So let's talk for a second about Hegel. Hegel is one of the most obtuse and difficult to understand philosophers to read. He's even more difficult to interpret and understand. So I am not suggesting that you go out and begin reading Georg Hegel. Just don't. There's no reason for you to do that unless you enjoy that kind of self-punishment. But as it goes in the world of philosophy, someone that almost nobody really understands <laughs> becomes one of the most influential philosophers for the span of about 100 years. So the turn of the 1700s to the 1800s and early 1800s, most of European philosophy is some kind of reaction to Hegel. So here's what Marx is reacting to, reacting to. Hegel had this really interesting vision of how history worked. So he believed history was deliberately progressing toward a good and perfect end. He believed that history was a certain kind of um, and here's where some of it gets fuzzy, was a certain kind of spirit, and it was a capital S spirit. So the world is a spiritual world. He believed that the progress of history was a certain kind of evidence for the existence of God. He's not a Christian in the sense that you and I would understand what it means to be a Christian, but he believed there was this universal God-like spirit to the world, and that history progressed through its own self-awareness of reason 
and was headed toward a goal. So a version of um, progressivism is built into Hegel's vision of history. It's moving forward. This ideal spirit and reason is helping us get there. Um, when most people talk about the one thing they know about Hegel, they talk about his vision of how history worked. And, and he had this kind of vision where he believed it was a sort of um, push-pull resolution. History would start going down one track, and then a group of people would come along and another, another set of influential folks would say, this track is the wrong track, so we're going we're gonna to push it off on this track a little bit. And then after a little bit of time, there'd be a, a kind of resolution and we would end up here. Then history would continue to go like this and then go, no, not like this. So it's called thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So history had this back and forth to it, but it was always progressing toward the good goal. So Marx takes that. In fact, most, most philosophers in the 1800s take that concept and concepts around it, and then they begin to develop their own philosophy. Marx just happens to do it with history and with a few other things. But Marx found that concept flawed in a couple of significant ways. The first is that Marx said there's no such thing as God, there's no such thing as spirit. Marx um, and those that he wrote with and worked with and his disciples, hardcore atheists. Not spiritual, but not religious. That wasn't these guys. Hardcore atheists. So you see, the universe is material. It's not spiritual at all. And then he also said we do not sort of find history progressing toward the good. We make it progress toward the good. Here's our goal, and here's how we're going to get there. There's no God who's going to take us anywhere. We're going to take us there. So Marx sort of turns that philosophy on its head and then begins to, in his set of ideas, to start pushing history in a certain direction. So we get this concept in Marx and in all of his disciples that there is a goal to history that there is potential in history. Um, anytime any Marxist, Marxist, neo-Marxist, cultural Marxist, uses phrases like what is possible in history or the goal of history, all of it is built on this concept that we are making utopia happen, okay? Different phrasing, different phraseology, but that's where it's headed. The goal of history is this fundamental concept. So there is a goal. There is an ideal to which we are headed. The ideal for Karl Marx and even his disciples is this version of pure communism. Now, in a twist of vocabulary, they believe that the form of pure communism is the only true form of democracy. That when we finally get to a classless state in which all of the means of production and jobs and land and cars are owned by everybody equally, nobody makes money off of anybody else, that is their vision of pure democracy. It is pure communism, where the ideal state has been realized. Socialism is, in their view, what they called a way station. It's like you get on a train and you're headed to Utopia. Along the way, you're going to pass through these little towns called socialism. One degree of socialism, another degree of socialism, and another degree of socialism. All versions of the state is starting to own and control the economy. And it's not just, you know... Uh, Big businesses, all of a sudden the government's owning big business. The government runs education. The government runs police departments. The government runs all of these things. And the further down the path we go, the closer we get to the ideal goal of communism. How we get there is different for different people, but that's the kind of train that we're on. So there is a goal. And there is an ideal way of doing things. And then <clears throat> revolution is necessary. Always. Revolution is always necessary. So you're going to hear that language, revolution, cultural revolution. 
Again, you hear that vocabulary? It's just right out of the Marxist playbook and all of his disciples. So revolution is necessary because we're not waiting for the ideal spirit to make things good for us. It's because we're making things good for us. And the only way to overcome the oppressor is revolution. What kind of revolution are we talking about? Well, it depends. But revolution is always necessary. So we make it happen. We may need to revolt often enough to reach the pure idea and so forth. Marx believed that revolution was the natural consequence of capitalism. So there is, uh, capitalism has a bad name in our culture right now. So the, the research and the surveys tell us that the younger a person is, the more they distrust or dislike capitalism. Why is that the case? And they, they'll do that research while they're on their phones, right? <laughs> they distrust capitalism. Why is, that, why is that the case? Because it has been built into this ideology and this ideology has been built into our culture now. That capitalism is the worst state possible and that workers would grow so frustrated by being enslaved by their employers, they would rise up in res revolution and they would overthrow their employers and they would start the process of making their way to this ideal goal. And they believed that the industrial West at the time, so this is the late 1800s, Germany, Great Britain, eventually the United States, they believed it was ripe for, and when they mean revolution then, they mean shooting people, lining them up against the wall and killing them. That's, that's the kind of revolution that they're talking about. So here's more language that is in our vocabulary right now that comes straight out of this ideology. The oppressor must be overthrown by the oppressed. Must be. It's a moral, it's a moral dictate, right? If you just define... This group of people as the oppressors, this group of people as the oppressed, then the only moral thing to do, the only way to find justice is for the oppressed to overthrow the oppressors. So for Karl Marx, the worker was the oppressed and the capitalist was the oppressor, the owner of the business, the owner of the steel mill in Great Britain was the oppressor of everybody. <clears throat> and this is, how, this is how some of the thinking went. So if you own a business, you're, gonna employ, you're going to pay an employee a certain amount of money. You're going to sell a product for a certain amount of money. Your employee is going to make money because you sold that product. And then the owner of the business is going to make money because they sold that product as well. So that product is the value of the labor plus the value of the owner of the business, so both of them are making money. Karl Marx believed that this was, this, was a, this, was, uh, this, this was a certain kind of economic slavery, that the laborer was being undersold by the employer because the employer is making all of this extra money, profit. How evil is profit in our world right now, right? That the employer is making that extra money because they're just not paying the employee enough. And Marx believed that the longer employees realized that they were being treated as these economic slaves, they were eventually going to rise up against their oppressors. Well, it wasn't happening. It didn't actually happen in most of the industrialized world because of, instead of rev revolution, usually what happened is they did things like change laws or start labor unions. That's another way of fixing a problem that you think or you can shoot the people who employ you. They're, you know, you can go one way or another. The very first line of the Communist Manifesto. Now, here's a book that if you're half interested in this stuff, it's very short, um, and maybe you should read it. First line in the Communist, because I'm going to give you some quotes that you don't believe are in the Manifesto, but they are. First line, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. The owner versus the employee, the wealthy versus the poor, the capitalist versus the labor. And it's just this constant struggle. And he believed the world was at a tipping point and it was the revolution tipping point. 
And now we're going to finally get rid of this. And we're going to be on the way to a classless society in our perfect ideal world. <clears throat> the historical possibility or the um, democratic utopia, the ways in which this is talked about in his philosophy. So this is a fun little quirk. And by fun, I mean not fun. <laughs> Marx believed, and Marx's disciples still believe, that it was absolutely critical to free people from the ideas and structures that blinded them to their need for revolution. So Marx is going to argue that you don't know it yet, but you are an economic slave. And as soon as you're made to feel that, you will revolt. You will be on our team. And as many of you as we can possibly get on our team, the better we are. And if you're not on our team, we have to get rid of you. Why is cancel culture such a big deal in our culture right now? You have to be made to think the right things. And the other thoughts cannot be spoken out loud because revolution has to happen. I am not kidding you. I am not overstating this. This is the world that Antonio Gramsci and his disciples gave to us. So if you don't see it yet, or if you're too comfortable, you're not going to revolt and we're not going to reach the goal of history. So people have to be made to feel uncomfortable. They need to be made to be feel, like, feel like this is wrong and something needs to be done about it. So the Marxist world does some really radical things. There goes our resident Marxist right now. <laughs> Actually, he has some very personal feelings about commies, and you can ask him later about that one. <clears throat> Family. Communists believe you needed to get rid of it. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean that literally. The normal family structure, you separate parents from kids and kids from parents. Um, so Marx argues in the Communist Manifesto, and other of his disciples argue that um, parenting is a form of economic slavery, that parents own their child's labor, and they shouldn't. The state owns your child's labor. And you should not be allowed to educate them in certain ways. You shouldn't be allowed to use their labor because the state is allowed to use their labor. <clears throat> and so the Marxist vision of family and kids is to educate kids away from their parents. Does that sound like anything that some people are concerned about right now? Of state-run schooling educating kids away from their parents' values. It's because we are living in this world right now, especially certain major parts of the structure of our culture. So <clears throat> there'll be a few things along the way that might, be, that might get me in trouble from time to time, but hey, this is, this is why I do these kinds of things. I just ran across this detail recently, and I found it absolutely fascinating. So Chairman Mao, you know who Chairman Mao is? So Chairman Mao... <laughs> Yes, he is the Lenin-Stalin version of the Chinese Communist Party and the Cultural Revolution in the early 20th century and the tens of millions of Chinese people that he killed in order to bring about his utopia. That's Chairman Mao. Did you know that President Biden quotes Chairman Mao on a regular basis? And he calls it, and he says the same thing every single time. This was fascinating to me in all of his prepared speeches. He calls it an ancient Chinese proverb. It's not an ancient Chinese proverb. It goes back about 80 years. It's about as ancient as he is, I guess, if you want to call it ancient. But here's what he says. He says the ancient Chinese proverb says that women hold up half of the world. Now, that's an interesting statement. So you think, well, okay, well, on one level, it's just, you know, there are two genders, and so the women are the other half of this. So they hold up half of the world. They, they do their work. Everybody else is their work. And, you know, it sounds like, hey, this is, this is yeah, innocuous. What Chairman Mao meant was 
we have to put women in the rice fields and the factories. We have to separate them from their families and their kids and put them to work. And the actual phrase that he would use is women hold up half the sky. So that, that, that was his version of it. So every time President Biden uses that phrase, he uses it in the context, we need women in the labor force. Now, he doesn't know what he's quoting, but that is the concept of we're separating moms and dads from their family. We're going to step in as the educators and caretakers of the family because women help hold up half of the world for us. That's what is meant by that phrase. Say, okay, so a lot of this stuff that just gets thrown out there from time to time it's not nearly as innocuous as we might think. Private property. <clears throat> Owning private property in the Marxist world is another hindrance. If you have stuff, if you have your home, if you have your job, if you have the clothes on your back and in your closet, if you have stuff, you feel relatively comfortable, at least comfortable enough to not be a crazy revolutionary out in the streets killing people. So what has to happen? You have to be separated from your private property. So Marx argues explicitly for the end of private property. Private property, so this is another one of these things that in our American culture right now, as you kind of go through the research and the polls and the stats and all that good stuff, the younger you are, the more likely are you, to, you are to believe that private property is oppressive. Private property is the only thing that protects an individual from anyone else who is stronger or who has more political power. If the law protects you and your private property, then the government or anybody else can't come and just take your stuff. But if all of that legal protection is gone and there's no such thing as private property, strongest one wins, period. And who in Marx's vision is the strongest one? It's gonna be the state. It's going to be the group of self-appointed bureaucrats who believe that they can do it better than you can for yourself. So he argues for the end of private property. And then religion. So Marx famously called religion the opiate of the masses. What in the world does he mean by that? He also called it the flowers in the chains. Here's what he means by that. That if you are religious, if you're, especially in his world, Jewish or Christian, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. It's the drug that makes you dull to reality. So I believe in Christ and the hope that he gives me in this world and in the world to come. So one of the things that that means is I'm not a radical revolutionary on the streets flipping over cars and shooting people because I have an entirely different hope in my life. And Mark says it's like a drug. God doesn't exist, atheism is true, it's all false, but it's a drug. So we have to separate people from their religion. We have to. The, the maybe clearer image is his image of it's the flowers in the chains. You are chained up in this world, but all you can see is the flowers. So we have to strip away all of the flowers of your religious faith so that you can see the chain and get angry enough and start killing people, right? This is the Marxist vision of getting rid of religion. So both Marx and Engels and all of their disciples, they were atheists. They considered, that a, they considered it a fundamental tenet of communism and of socialism. This is so important. To them, in their philosophy, it was a fundamental tenet. There was no such thing as a communist or a socialist who was not also an atheist. So Engels, who was the guy who wrote most of Das Kapital later on in Marx's life, he actually said, of course there's no such thing as Christian socialists. He said, you, you don't get it. You actually have to get rid of religion to make any of this happen. Because people who are religious and people who have hope inside of the church, the, in his world, the Protestant Lutheran church or the Catholic church, you're never gonna become a communist or a socialist. So who's this group of people who call themselves Christian socialists right now. Joseph Stalin had a phrase for them. It's a, it's a beautiful phrase. It's a wonderful phrase. It's a great way to insult people. <laughs> he called them useful idiots. He said, they're useful to my cause and they have no clue. They've joined my team and my team is out to destroy them. And they're on my team. That's great. 
I'm going to call them useful idiots. And so it is. In communist states, every time it's been tried, the church is either shut down or controlled as much as possible by the communist state. That's why we talk about the underground church in totalitarian states, because the faithful church is always underground to a certain degree, at least. And so the goal of the Communist Party in other cultures where they can't just control the church or throw it underground is to infiltrate the church. So, and and this is a great big long story. There's no need for us to get into it now. There's actually congressional record because there was, um, there were Senate hearings, congressional hearings about this very thing um, in the 20s and 30s and 40s uh, here in the United States of America. Um, But the Communist Party was infiltrating into Protestant seminaries and Catholic seminaries. They knew that they could actually turn liberal Protestant pastors in the early 20th century and turn them into communists and then slowly turn them into atheists. And guess what? They succeeded with a pile of them. So if you can't control them, versions of yourself, but now just with collars and with robes. Um, so I gave you guys the, uh, the Ten Commandments of Communism. This was a youth brochure created by a group called the Commissal, the Youth Organization of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. So this was a youth brochure. So if you were a young commie, if you were a 14-year-old and you were just, I mean, you were all in, they would give you this highly colored brochure because kids can only read things if it's full of colors and bright fonts and smiling, you know, dogs and things. You know, they'd give you the brochure. And here are our 10 commandments for you. If you're a 17-year-old commie in the U.S., here's here's what you believe. And you're, you're smart people. So tell me if you've sensed a trend inside of these Ten Commandments. Number one, never forget that the clergy is the most powerful enemy of the communist state. The clergy, unless you've already given in, but that's a whole other thing. Number two, try to win your your friends over to communism and remember that Stalin, who has given a new constitution to the Russian people, is the leader of the anti-God army, not only in the USSR, but throughout the world. Convince your friends not to have any contact with priests. Watch out for spies and report saboteurs to the police. One way to create cohesion in a tribe of people is to create a very powerful us versus them philosophy. We're on the end, you're on the end, and everybody's against you. So it creates this powerful sense of community, of tribalism. Make sure that atheist publications are distributed amongst the largest uh, uh, possible number of people. A good young communist must also be a militant atheist. He must know how to use his weapons and be experienced in the art of war. And they mean that literally in that day and age. Wherever you can, you must fight religious elements and prevent whatever influence they might have on your comrades. A true godless, an individual who is godless, must also be a good police agent. It is the duty of all the atheists to guard the security of the state. So you now become an informant on your neighbor in your family. Support the godless movements with your money, which is especially necessary for our propaganda abroad where funds under present circumstances can only be spent secretly. If you are not a convinced atheist, you cannot be a good communist or a real Soviet citizen. Atheism is indissolubly bound to communism. These two ideals are the pillars of Soviet power. So, a trend. (laughs) Did you catch the trend in the 10 commandments of communism church bad church bad church really bad be afraid of faith don't hang out with priests if you're really going to be godless you actually have to distribute atheist literature and make sure as many of your friends as possible and remember the church is the biggest enemy to the communist state the church is the biggest enemy do we believe that anymore do we understand that anymore i don't think we do that the church is the greatest enemy. So why must the church be silenced in our culture now? Because we're living in this world, a version of this world now. All right, so a few, um, a few quotes um, from some of these uh, individuals from the Communist Manifesto. Communism begins where atheism begins. Communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality. And he means that seriously. We'll get to another quote later on from from Lenin. 
Did you know that um, Lennon's body was mummified and is in a glass, glass coffin? You can actually go visit the body of Lennon. You only do that with people you believe are very, very special. <clears throat> Marx also writes, man makes religion. Religion does not make man. The abolition of religion is the illusory um, happiness of the people is the demand for real happiness. So religion is the flowers and the chains. It's an illusion of happiness. True happiness is atheism. Get rid of that religion stuff. Again, from the Communist Manifesto, abolition of the family, exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up of this infamous proposal of the communists. Abolish the family. What in the world? Do you know who said this on our What We Believe page? What's that? BLM. BLM. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. Why would they, do, why would they say that? Vladimir Lenin. Is there such a thing as a communist as communist ethics? Is there such a thing as communist morality? Of course there is. In what sense do we reject ethics? Reject morality? In the sense given to it by the bourgeoisie, which is all of those special people we have to throw against the wall, who based ethics on God's commandments. On this point, we, of course, said that we do not believe in God. We reject any morality based on extra human and extra class concepts. Lenin is still with us today in the belief that ethics are determined by class consciousness. We no longer, we typically don't call it class consciousness anymore. What we call it is intersectionality. What we call it is, and this is a phrase we'll get to later on. We, it, so the normal phrase is lived experience. Lived experience determines what is true, what is moral, what is immoral. Um, the more technical phrase for that is called standpoint epistemology. The only truth that there is is the truth that comes from my point of view. So we're, we're still living in this world of his. We say morality is what serves to destroy the old exploiting society and to unite all the working people around the proletariat, which is building up a new communist society. So it's clear. It's not... Well, you can give or take. You can be a Christian on this day and a commie on the other day. You, we can pull that into the church and everything is going to be just fine. It is built to destroy religion. It's built to destroy faith. Okay? So don't let anybody else convince you otherwise. All right. So some concepts that come out of Marx that we need to track through time because... Again, so he had one theory, and it was economic. His vision of revolution was actual physical bloodshed revolution. Um, but the vision that we're living with now, the version of Marxism that we're living with now is, has changed. So it's not economic. It is primarily cultural. So we call it cultural Marxism now, um, or most thinkers call it cultural Marxism now because it's changed just a little bit, and we'll talk about how and why that changes. Um, and it's not bloody revolution right now. We have another revolution to accomplish before we can get to that one. And we're in, we are literally living in that stage of that pre-revolutionary movement um, that Gramsci talked about um, before we get to the bloody revolution. That's what we're going through right now. So it's morphed over time, but some of these concepts are still the same. So what's going on around us? Um, and what do these words mean? Revolution again. So upheaval is necessary to make the establishment feel uncomfortable. We heard a lot of this language in the summer of 2020. If you listen to people who were in favor of a lot of the riots, um, a lot of the property damage, and in some cases, a lot of the bloodshed that happened in the summer of 2020, there was a kind of moral blindness to it because the belief was the higher moral goal was to make everybody understand how angry we are. So all of the rest of this violence is justified in service of the revolution. So this is how relativistic morality works. We have found a different moral standard, so we're going to redefine the word violence. And we're going to say some bloodshed is just fine because what's most important is that you people feel uncomfortable. 
If you're playing by the rules, so this is Marxist as well. If you think, well, instead of revolution, why don't we just elect different people or write our senators or peacefully protest? Well, the Marxist vision of that is, well, you're, you've already lost the game because you're playing according to the establishment's rules. So the establishment, the oppressors, are telling you, here's how you change things. You elect different people. You engage in civil disobedience. You peacefully protest. As long as you stay in these safe little boundaries, you've already lost the game. The oppressors have already told you what to do, so you have to break those boundaries. Peaceful protest, no good. Violent protest is the only way to go. So violence in service of the revolution is morally acceptable. I got into it with a, um, uh, with a guy on Twitter who uh, called himself, in, this is his own self-description, he was a progressive Christian pastor. And I was getting pretty grumpy somewhere in the middle of 2020. And I had posted something about the damage that had been done. And he just comes after me on Twitter and he refuses, refuses to acknowledge that property damage has been done that people have died, that things have burned down. He refuses to even acknowledge it. Why? Because he's morally blind to it. He believes all of that is just fine. And here he is pastoring a church somewhere in the Midwest. The most important thing is the oppressors need to know what's gone wrong. It just, it just blows my mind. So oppressed versus oppressor. This now becomes, so Karl Marx's first line of the Communist Manifesto, all of history up to this point has been class struggle, oppressor versus oppressed, that's it. Well, the Marxist idea continues with exactly the same thought. This is all history is, oppressor versus oppressed. We just change who fits into each of these categories. So oppressors now are a different group of people. The oppressed are now a different group of people. And I guarantee you I am going on... I am going on record now. This is forever on the internet. This is how the internet works. The group of people who are today in the category of oppressed and oppressor will change within five years. That's just how this works. It's not about resolving something. It's about maintaining tension for political gain. That's how Marxism works. So what you think now are the categories of oppressed and oppressed is just going to change. Classes of people who are perpetually innocent, classes of people who are perpetually guilty, no matter who they are or what they are, people who are, again, being thrown inside of classes of people and judged, um, not by their individual worth and merit, but by classes. This is all this matter of oppressed versus oppressor. Religion and family. Um, just uh, just kind of tie up this bow just a little bit. So cultural Marxism necessarily usurps traditional religion. This is how it works. Um, God competes with the state and with utopia. Either the state is God or God is God. And if you believe God is God, then the idea goes, you don't think the state is God. But if you're a Marxist to some stripe, you believe the state is God. So who has to go? God has to go. It's, it's, it's a pretty universal. Religion is both the largest roadblock to Marxism, to communism, as well as the biggest potential gain. Does that make sense? It's either the most significant roadblock to their ideal or the best possible gain they could possibly get. If I can get a denomination into my back pocket, I've won. I don't need to silence you. You're now on my team. And this has been going on now for a long time. There's a phrase we're going to talk about next time. I'm going to give to you now, and we'll fiddle with it in a little while. A phrase that, is, um, that has become sort of a touchstone in Marxism in the last 70 years or so. It's called the Long March Through the Institutions. So these frustrated Marxists in the 40s, 50s, and 60s realized the revolutions weren't working. The physical revolutions weren't working. So they went back to this guy by the name of Antonio Gramsci, and they decided what we need to do now, instead of shooting people first, we have to co-opt all of the cultural structures. 
And if we can actually begin to control education from university to high school to middle school to K through, you know, to um, K through sixth grade through fifth grade, if we can begin to control those teachers and those systems, then we can re-educate kids. If we can control the legal system, then we can then we can actually get in that culture system. If we can control the media and movies and uh, pop culture, if we can get into that, and it's this long, patient march through the institutions. So pop culture changes. Education changes, politics changes, HR structures and corporations change because they've been doing this for a very long time and they've been doing it on purpose. So there is a cultural revolution that has to happen first, then the other revolution can happen as well. The objective versus subjective morality. We mentioned, we noticed this communism itself, this ideology becomes the standard for what is moral or immoral. It's still the case. Even though it's changed, it's still the case. A handful of respected elitist authorities tell you what is true and what is false. It's still the case. Um, the supremacy of the state over family and civic organizations. We don't have a lot of time for this, but this is another really important reality. So think about it like this for a second. Families, churches, local politicians elected by the neighbors, local school boards, local charities, all of these kinds of things that happen on the local level actually give the vast majority of people their personal structure. So the vast majority of the time, that's how people find their support in life. This is how they find their moral training and moral guidance in life. The family they grew up in, the organizations that they're a part of, um, the organizations that they belong to, that's where support comes from, that's where moral guidance comes from. That's where most of our time and effort and energy and money goes to are these local organizations like a local church or like your immediate actual family. All of that is a hindrance to the state doing all of that for you. You see, in communism, the Marxist state, the perfect democratic utopia means the state does all of that for you. It gives you your moral structure. It takes care of all of your provisions. It educates you. It takes you from cradle to grave. But the only way for the state to do that is to get rid of everything else in its way. That's why the family is always a target. The church is always a target of these ideologies. And then utopianism, right? This, um, okay, here's another 50 cent phrase you can impress your friends with. It is an over-realized eschatology, right? I just love these phrases. Eschatology is a theological word for the doctrine of end time things, how everything wraps up, how everything gets put together, the book of Revelation, that kind of stuff. But an over-realized human eschatology means we're gonna bring utopia here and now. We're gonna, we're gonna cause Armageddon so that we can get to utopia. And we're going to do it. So this is inbred inside of the Marxist structure, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to keep walking down this path and we're going to get to a lot of the things that were radically important in the summer of 2020 or the phrases we started hearing for the very first time and why we got there. And again, make sense of how it, all of it is, is anti-gospel, is not uh, scripture, is not the church, is not what Christ leads us to. So to understand what the thing is, is to help us understand why it is vastly different from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from the church, from the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Two radically opposite things. And we're living in a world that's just going in these directions. This is a lot of this political tension in our world right now is going in these opposite directions because of some of these ideologies.